Let's get into your guts. I don't think you need me to completely go over the anatomy and physiology of the GI system. We know what your mouth is and what it does. Um, part of the reason why babies uh, spit up is because their lower esophageal sphincter is not fully developed until around age one. Um, for your stomach, this is a great place to look at overfeeding, obviously, because it's your stomach. Uh, the newborn stomach capacity is only 10 to 20 mLs. Um, so when you've got mothers trying to feed a newborn an entire bottle of formula, they're creating some issues. At two months, it's 200 mLs. That's a marked difference. And then by the time we've reached adulthood, we're in the thousands. We're at 2,500 to 3,000 mLs of capacity in our stomach. So the small intestines are not mature when you're born. And your biliary system, um, your pancreatic enzymes, they're not really working at their full steam ahead kind of level until they reach uh, two years old. So children are at much higher risk for fluid balance losses, um, dehydration. Half of your total body water is an extracellular amount until you're two years old. Um, so half is in your cells and half is outside your cells. Um, that's a large difference from how it works when we're adults. I'd like you guys to look up what the adult body fluid balance is, intracellular versus extracellular. Um, know what insensible loss is. If you don't already, you need to look it up. Children lose a lot of fluid through insensible water loss through their skin. It's like with any other part of the body, when a patient comes in with GI issues, we're gonna do a really effective health history, trying to find out what their normal is and how they've been acting in the recent past. So we wanna ask about their family history, their history, their surgical history, how they eat, how they stool, all as being uh, part of their baseline health history. But then we also need to know when the symptoms started, how we managed them. We need to know when the last time they ate or drank was, how many times they're vomiting or having diarrhea, and we wanna ask about pain. So when we're doing our physical exam, obviously you wanna do the least invasive to the most invasive. So you're walking in the room and you're looking at the kid's color, you're able to see whether they're pale or yellow. They should have pink moist mucosa they should have tears. So if you have a mother or a father bringing in an infant saying they can't stop vomiting and they're not having as many uh, wet diapers as, as I'm used to seeing, but that baby is still squirting out tears while you're messing with it, it's probably not super dehydrated yet and you can focus on looking towards some oral rehydration. When we're assessing the abdomen, we want to, when babies are laying down, um, it looks like they're kind of swollen like a frog belly, and that is normal. Um, let's see, mental status. When you're dehydrated, it, irritability and restlessness, those are early signs of dehydration, but if you are sleeping through my annoying exam or not fighting me, that's a late sign of pretty severe dehydration. We don't like it when they don't fight back. 
So when you're assessing the abdomen, you're going to auscultate first. If you hear lots of tinkling and lots of noises, obviously that's probably a diarrhea or a gastroenteritis kid. Um, if you don't hear much, or it's very few and far between, that's usually obstruction. After you've auscultated, you're going to palpate, and you don't have to really get in there if the kid is coming with GI issues, but you're going to palpate for tenderness, lesions, muscle tone, and looking to see if there's rebound in the right lower quadrant. That means you're pressing on the right lower quadrant, and when you let go, it hurts more. That is a warning sign for an appendicitis. Um, you're going to be looking at elevated white counts. You're going to be looking for elevation in the CRP and SED rate, obviously because that's indicative of what? Inflammation and infection. And we're likely going to have a lot of CT scans here. So when you're collecting stool specimens from kids, it's a little bit different from doing from adults, especially if they are diapered. So most of the time, I keep the little stool specimen collection kit in the bathroom um, of the patient's room. I explain to the family that I would need to take the specimen so not to throw diapers away, um, or if the child is able to toilet by themselves, then I give them a fresh clean urine hat and they're gonna go in that and try real hard not to get pee in it because that messes it up. So then you use a little tongue depressor blade and you scrape up the poop out of the diaper or the urine hat and put it in the collection container. Double bag it, just gonna say Pro tip, um, cleansing enemas. We do a lot of enemas on little ones, a lot. Um, when it says it's used for fecal impaction and severe constipation, if you actually look up uh, the, the nursing intervention of utilizing an enema, one of the things it says is to be very wary of doing this in a child with a fecal impaction or severe constipation because if you're forcefully squirting fluid up against an impaction or blockage, you could potentially be pushing it further up. So it is not always the best idea if you suspect that a child has a pretty severe blockage and the doctor has ordered uh, an enema for this child, I would have a discussion with them and there are times when you can do the enema through like a red robin Foley catheter or a red robin catheter. Um, you insert that into the rectum and flush slowly with a 10 cc syringe attached to the bottom of it that has the, the solution in it. And that can be a little bit less abrasive, but still get the fluid in there. Um, you're gonna see kids with lots of feeding tubes, a lot of NGs. Well, they hate them. I've never ever met a smiling child with an NG tube. Um, ostomies, we see a lot of that. It's hard to manage ostomies in little children that are diapered or running around when they're, they tend to rip them just when they're sleeping. Um, so, I'll give you some important pro tips about keeping the room from smelling like poo uh, when we're in class together. And oral rehydration therapy. Obviously, we want to give them the opportunity to drink if they can. Gastroenteritis is super common. It can be caused by so many different things. It is literally just a swelling of the GI and well, of the stomach and intestines, gastro, entero, and itis. Um, and it can be caused by viruses, bacteria, parasites, sometimes ingestion of uh, certain toxins. 
So obviously how severe your gastroenteritis is, is dependent completely on how much your body is losing. So we're going to look at these kids physical and um, we're going to do a physical assessment that's going to tell us whether or not they are severely dehydrated or not. I'm not getting into the mechanism of how gastroenteritis works. Um, I do want you to know that rotavirus and norovirus, they are crazy nasty. They kill babies and elderly people. Um, norovirus blows through a rehabilitation or a skilled nursing facility and you lose a lot of people. Um, it's painful as well. A lot of cramping and diarrhea. Um, Giardia is a really common parasite that we see um, and often you find out that these kids have been camping somewhere and they've been playing in a river or a lake and here you go, Giardia. This little bullet down at the bottom that says, if vomiting is occurring with diarrhea, it's most likely gastroenteritis. So grody, but we've all had that illness where you're in the bathroom and you also maybe need to have a trash bag. So you're sitting and you're puking. So that's gastroenteritis. Here's some basic numbers for classifying dehydration. Obviously, if you've lost greater than 9% of your body weight um, in fluid, that's crazy. Um, one kilogram of body weight loss equals, or I'm sorry, one kilogram of fluid loss equals one whole liter of fluid. Um, I used to take care of a kid who had an issue with this and hopefully we will talk about it on Wednesday. Remind me. So we're going to look at the child's weight. We're going to weigh them daily and we want to make sure that we weigh them on the same scale. That's really important. Don't grab a different kind of scale or a scale from a different area. Make it the same scale. At Loma Linda, the scales were numbered. So we had like, you know, 15 infant scales and five rolling standing scales. And we had them numbered so that we could remember or chart which one they were weighed on. I am not going to get into um, looking at whether or not we have an isotonic or uh, an isotonic dehydration, that type of stuff. I'm sure you guys have gone through that multiple times in med surge. So within the signs and symptoms, um, babies are going to have less wet diapers and we need to ask parents. How many wet diapers do they normally have? How many wet diapers are they having now? Sometimes this is a difficult answer for parents to give you because I know for myself, I feel like I was changing diapers all day long. Maybe it was only six or seven, but to me it was all day. Um, every five seconds I'm having to change that kid. So if you asked me to tell you exactly how many there were, I wouldn't be able to, I'd just have to ballpark it. So if the baby or child has no tears when they're crying, if the inside of their mouth, if the oral mucosa is sticky or dry, that's bad. Lethargy, bad. Poor skin turgor. I want you guys to tell me where we assess skin turgor on an infant or a small child. We're going to see increased respiratory rates. Their fontanelles, if they're still present, um, are going to be sunken in and they're going to have sunken little eyeball sockets with pretty dark circles around it. 
their skin color might be abnormal. They might be pale. They might be kind of ruddy or ashen looking. Um, and they might have a temperature because maybe fever is causing them to lose water. Anybody who's still having an issue with calculating your output in the clinical setting, let us know. Let's go over it. This is the scale that we're going to use. Um, infants and toddlers greater than two to three kgs per hour. Um, actually, it should be two to three mLs per kilogram per hour. Um, and same for the school age. Since if that's not in there, I'm sorry. This is a dehydration comparison chart. Um, just letting you know what you would be likely to see as we go from less severe to more severe um, dehydration. So they could still be dehydrated and have normal pink, soft, fluffy, moist mucosa. Their skin could still be elastic and they could still have a brisk capillary refill. Once we've gotten to the point where they're cool or modeled, if you don't know what modeling is, ask me um, in class and their cap refill might be really delayed. Um, you're going to see tinting. You're going to see them going from an increased heart rate and respiratory rate to low and slow. Um, and then we're going to see sunken fontanelles. Okay, so when we're talking about the therapeutic management or, or treating hypovolemia or severe dehydration, even mild uh, dehydration, we're going to try always to do oral rehydration. If it's a small child, um, part of their comfort mechanism is sucking. Um, so we don't want to keep it from them, but we also don't want them to have increased fluid loss from vomiting. Um, most of these kids, we're going to give them a bolus or um, a rehydration maintenance fluid, like one and a half times maintenance, um, and then we'll reassess them. We give our boluses in pediatrics usually over 30 minutes to an hour. We don't like to just hang it high and let it run and give them a whole liter. We are very specific with the weight-based dosing and we don't let it flow in at the rate that it's able to just intrinsically. We manage it. Um, we set a, an IV pump. So we obviously want to treat whatever's causing their dehydration. So if they're having vomiting, we need to look at whether it's due to something that's infectious or they're having an obstruction. Are they in a DKA? Have they had a, a head injury? Did they receive some sort of food poisoning? Um, took care of a family that had maybe a three week old infant that was vomiting a lot and uh, having a lot of diarrhea and it ended up coming back positive for salmonella and nobody could figure out why that was. It's because most of us, I know I did as a mother when I was breastfeeding, you know, I'm doing things around the house. I sit down, I grab my baby and I am put them on the breast. My hand is involved in that though. And um, this mom probably, and she did say she didn't wash her hands before she would breastfeed each time. So she likely had carried salmonella on her hands from like cooking, you know, dealing with raw chicken or raw foods and then touched her breast with, then got to the baby. So teaching hand washing is actually a really important thing, is even if you're breastfeeding. Um, We need to look at whether or not there's allergies that is causing vomiting or diarrhea. They could have celiac disease. They could have IBD or IBS. 
So I want you guys to think about what the, the worst possible complication would be in a dehydration patient. And then what nursing assessment would you need to do um, or would you need to start if this complication develops? So give me your complication that you would expect to see with dehydration, the worst one, and then tell me what nursing, assess nursing assessment you'd need to do to identify it. Then also tell me what your actions would be. Oral rehydration therapy. One of the things I like to tell parents is it's really hard when you don't feel good and your stomach's cramping up um, to take things in. And if parents are giving things in a sippy cup or in a bottle, um, they might not be, even a child that's able to drink out of a cup, if they have free will, they might just not take it. It seems like a whole lot, their stomach hurts, they don't wanna to have to drink that whole bottle. And so one of the things that I do is I ask them to take whatever the child's favorite juice might be um, and dilute it with some water or Pedialyte. The reason that we wanna dilute it is because we don't want them to have tons and tons of sugar because that makes diarrhea worse. Um, Gatorade also has a ton of sugar in it and can make diarrhea worse. So you can dilute those things with like half and half water and the juice or Gatorade and then mix it with Pedialyte, put it in the freezer till it gets to a slushy consistency. Um, and then just give the kid a teaspoon of it. It's gonna make their mouth feel good because most of the time when you're dehydrated, you're having a febrile sort of illness um, or your mouth is just so dry. So the cool, nice, icy consistency of the slushy, they're okay with taking it most of the time. Plus it's kind of like a treat, but also the teaspoon doesn't seem like a whole lot. But if you do that every 15 to 20 minutes around the clock, you're basically giving them the amount of fluids that we would want them to have to stay hydrated orally, but not all at once. So you're gonna give their stomach a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and we'll, we're less likely to have the vomiting and diarrhea occur because we're doing it slowly and we're giving the stomach some time. So that, that's my suggestion most of the time, and it's easy to do that at home. So we do 50 to 100 milliliters per kilogram over four hours of oral rehydration. We don't really calculate this. Um, if you're calculating it in the clinical space, if it's that severe, they wouldn't be receiving oral rehydration, they'd be getting it through an IV. Um, after they're able to tolerate some liquids, then we start a regular diet. You'll see often in the emergency department for children, they'll come in, parents say they're having all these issues with vomiting. Um, they do what they call a oral trial. They give them uh, an apple juice box to drink or some Sprite or ginger ale. And they wait an hour or two to see if they vomited up. If they don't, they send them home. So. Um, once you're to the point where you're just not vomiting a whole lot anymore, then usually you can start to eat. Having a lot of diarrhea does not necessarily mean that you can't have your regular diet. Uh, the vomiting with a regular diet is more of an issue. With dehydration, I'm sorry, with diarrhea leading to dehydration, we still want to have some some nutrients put into your body and see how much of it you might be able to absorb. Um, so they don't necessarily have to stop eating, but we like to use things like a brat diet 
look that up. I have never used an oral rehydration solution. I have never seen it used in the pediatric setting other than Pedialyte. Um, we're not usually measuring these things. We're not looking at the bottle, reading the fine print to see if it's 75 milliosmoles per liter of sodium chloride. So just an FYI. Uh, we go grab some Pedialyte out of a cabinet and we give it to them. If they want milk, we still give them milk, even though it says it's not appropriate. We still give them milk. If whatever they want, give it to them if they're dehydrated. We put a lot of infants on famotidine, older kids, some Tagamet. Sometimes we give infants Tagamet too. It just depends on the doctor's preference. Um, we see a lot of metoclopramide used. Put it on a pump, put it on a med pump. We don't want to cause any side effects from that one. Um, and metronidazole and amoxicillin are used a lot. With the amoxicillin, we usually see it being given as um, a mixture and it's augmentin. I want you to look at these risk factors. Most of them should be pretty easy to understand. Um, when you are born premature, you're going to have way less appropriate function of your GI system. Even as a full-term infant, you're not fully formed. Um, your intestines and your motility, all of those things don't work as well as we'd like them to. Um, foreign travel, you pick up a lot of parasites, things go bad. Kids with diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, trying to think sometimes asthma if they use steroids on a regular basis it uh, messes up their GI tract and they're more susceptible to grodiness occurring most of these you should know why they are risk factors for dehydration already um, diarrhea and vomiting it, all your, your stuff is coming out of you so you're gonna dehydrate Decreased oral intake, you're not bringing it into you. Sustained high fever, again, it's coming out of you. It's insensible water loss. But I need you guys to look up why diabetic ketoacidosis um, leads to dehydration. These are some acute GI disorders, meaning obviously they're happening in the acute phase and we're going to see them resolve within days usually um, although some of these the pyloric stenosis and tussiception malrotation and volvulus and appendicitis there they don't resolve on their own they're not self-limiting so um, there does have to be intervention I found these great images so in tussiception as you can see in the first really slimy pink image <laughs> is a telescoping of the bowels of the intestines so it kind of feeds into itself if you can imagine um, those telescopes that you can squish down to like from a foot long down to six inches long it kind of folds in on itself um that is what telescoping is and when that happens um, there can be blockage there can be pain the second picture is what we call a malrotation um, which has also led to a volvulus so some people use these terms interchangeably they're not really interchangeable terms malrotation is when the intestines don't turn like they should but malrotation leads to a volvulus, which is where the intestines are twisting up like a corkscrew. And you can see in this x-ray, there is a very visible corkscrew shape. Obviously, stuff can't pass through here. So we get some pretty severe blockages. Sorry for my dog that sounds like a chicken. 
So this is a nice little picture of what you might see in a textbook with um, intussusception. You can see the way that it has telescoped inside itself. This little aside here where it says current jelly, red current jelly stool, <laughs> It is not currant jelly, but I love that this is actually currant jelly in a ball jar, in a mason jar. Um, this is the most common sign of intussusception. If you are thinking maybe, if you're on the fence about it, if their poop looks like red currant jelly, it's intussusception. Um, this is a very common nurse question uh, for pediatrics, intussusception equals <laughs> red currant jelly poop. Okay, when you guys see this slide um, where it asks you, what is it? What is the patho? Blah, blah, blah. This is where you need to write this stuff down. I'm not going to continue writing it down for you. Um, so, Intussusception, usually, it's an otherwise healthy infant. They are usually younger than one year old. And it is three times more common in males than females. So we already went over what the pathology or pathophysiology is of this. The proximal segment of bowel telescopes into a more distal segment. Then edema happens. Then there's vascular compromise then there's obstruction. Sometimes it's related to a diverticulum, polyps, cysts, tumors, or the appendix, um, causing this to occur, but we might not know. Signs and symptoms. There is a sudden onset of severe pain, vomiting, diarrhea, the red currant jelly stools, and they can be lethargic. So there are some times where this intussusception can fix itself, and we will discuss that. It's common for them to have bile in their vomitus. Because they're obstructed, nothing's passing through, they're gonna be vomiting up bile. In the assessment of an intussusception patient, you are gonna see a mass and feel a mass that's shaped like a sausage. And it's gonna be in the upper mid abdomen. These patients often have mental status changes because they are obstructed. They are filling with toxins and they are dehydrated and ill not they don't have good nutritional intake some of the complications that we might have obstruction which can lead to perforation when your bowels perforate inside your own body that is a bad bad thing so the therapeutic management um, usually they will try a barium enema and they believe that the pressure from the barium enema will force the telescoped portion of bowel to kind of pop itself out. So if you've ever seen those like little, what's it called? A, I don't know what it's called. It, it looks like a little burrito and it's got water in it and kids can play with it and you can squish one side and then the other side gets bigger and it kind of, bloop, 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 bloop. I'll bring one in or I'll find a picture of it. It's kind of how I think of how you would reduce uh, into susception with a barium minima. If it doesn't reduce, you have to do surgery. Sometimes the surgeries are to place an ostomy on these kids, because um, sometimes it's pretty severe and they have to do a resection of the bowel. So they will do a resection, they'll put an ostomy, and then after the bowel has healed, they will do a reanastomosis, which is hooking the two sides of the chopped up bowel together. Nursing management, IV fluids, antibiotics before the barium procedure or before the surgical procedure, and we're going to provide emotional support. I found a picture. 
So this is one of those little water toys. And I, if you stuff one end as hard as you can up in the other side, and then you squeeze the side that you stuffed that end up into, it pushes itself back out. That's kind of what you're doing when you squirt the barium enema in there. All right, so cleft lip and palate. This is the most common craniofacial anomaly. It occurs once in every 700 births worldwide. You can find all this information on page 15, 16. Um, this happens early in the pregnancy um, where the lip and the palate and lip or palate don't fuse. So they assume between five and nine weeks of gestation. So it can go, the cleft on the lip can go all the way up into the nostril or it could be small and only uh, just above the lip. The cleft palate it could be a tiny opening or it could be the entire palate is open. Often after birth, you'll see a labor and delivery nurse um, stick their pinky in the child's mouth and rub it above the top of the, um, the palate and they're, they're checking to see if it is intact. So obviously some complications are going to be that they're going to have difficulty feeding. They're going to have, when they start growing their teeth, it's going to be different than it should be. Um, they might have delayed or altered speech development, and they're going to be at a higher risk for otitis media and ear infections. Why? Again, um, the eustachian tube and the way that we are connected as infants with our oral cavity, the way that everything kind of lines up, anything that affects your mouth can usually affect your ears and vice versa. Um, therapeutic management, these kids are gonna need surgery. They, they just have to have surgery. There are special bottles that will cover the palate so that they can continue to eat until they are healthy or ready for surgical repair but that's not a long-term solution so two to three months they'll have a cleft lip repair and then again at nine to 18 months they might do um, a cleft palate repair so lip at two to three months palate at nine to 18 months i have seen us do older children in the hospital setting um, three, four, five years old, usually they're coming from other countries. Nursing management, we're going to protect the airway and this is going to be individualized to how big the cleft is. Obviously we can't use the exact same airway management on a huge cleft as we would on a tiny cleft. Um, preventing injury to the suture line, we have to keep these kids hands away from their face after they have had their surgical procedure we can't let them rub it we have to always have them laying on their back or on their side because they will rub their little faces into the bed we usually do put them in elbow restraints um, we don't let them have spoons straws pacifiers or and we don't put their medications in their mouth using a plastic syringe because we don't want to do anything that can mess up the suture line we don't want them to be crying all the time either which really is not easy when you're telling them they can't have anything in their mouth and you're holding their arms down all day long so we're gonna do as many comfort measures and play as we can and we're going to give good judicious around the clock pain medications i did take care of a child uh she was old enough to walk around i think she was three or four we explained after the procedure how important it was for the parents to make sure that she allowed that uh, area to heal she did really well in the hospital setting, but she had no rules and no boundaries and the parents didn't do a whole lot of discipline. As they left the hospital, um, they had been discharged. They went out to the parking lot. Of course, they're letting this child just run through the parking lot like, a, you know, no rules. And um, she fell and smacked her face on the curb. <laughs> and had to come back into the hospital and have another surgery so come on um promoting adequate nutrition 
uh, we, they can breastfeed. There is a special nipple that can be used. Um, there are special um, attachments that can be put on the breast um, as a adjunct to breastfeeding to make the, the sucking easier for these children after surgery. We like to bring in lactation consultants and, and let them help us through that. They're going to burp these kids a lot because they are going to be kind of snarfling and take, rah, 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 taking in a lot of air while they're sucking. And we want to make sure that they are able to bond with their parent and that we provide emotional support. So these are some of the anomalies and complications you might see with a cleft lip and or palate. Heart defects, ear malformations, skeletal deformities, genitourinary abnormalities. A lot of this sounds like it could also occur in Down syndrome patients, which it does. And they do have cleft lip and palate often. Um, but it can be in an otherwise healthy child we might also see these types of anomalies. So we do want to check when we see a child come in or be born with a diagnosis of cleft lip and or palate, we do want to check their heart out for certain defects. This one is a super common one. You're going to see this a lot in pediatrics. Uh, it's one of the most common conditions requiring surgery in the first two months of life. Um, two to four out of a thousand births, that is a lot. Two to four kids out of a thousand are born with hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. We usually just call it pyloric stenosis. It is more often in males than females. It would be interesting for you guys to find some study that indicates why the males have more congenital GI disorders like intussusception, Hirschsprungs, and pyloric stenosis. Also, Crohn's disease, peptic ulcer disease. Someone needs to know that, right? You guys don't have to right now, but it's interesting. Um, the pathophysiology of pyloric stenosis is that um, the pylorus, which you can see in this little picture, um, there's a little muscle, it's a little sphincter, and the muscle becomes thick and it creates obstruction. Some of the signs and symptoms are that these babies have non-bilious, often projectile vomiting in the first month of life. In the first two weeks of life, they might have some normal eating with normal digestion because they're just not taking as much in. And so then we get to a little bit higher uh, volume intake level at four weeks, and that's when the vomiting starts. They have, and this usually is something that is tested on, one of the signs or cues is a movable or mobile little olive shape in the right upper quadrant. Now I'm gonna bring in the little baby doll and show you Oftentimes, people get this confused for the little lump we see at the sternum. It's not that. So there is a movable olive shape in the upper right quadrant, and this requires surgical consultation at that point. Um, the complications of a pyloric stenosis are dehydration, and then post-surgical complications, they don't really have much. Um, even if they vomit a little bit after they first start their feeds, it's okay. We just go a little slower. But this is a quick in and out, usually done laparoscopically. It's so easy. They come back with just a tiny little bit of glue on their abdomen right above their belly button. And they're good. But what's great is being the first person to give them their first feeding. <laughs> they're so grateful. <laughs> you get to be such a hero to that little baby. Um, so the surgical management is called a pyloromyotomy. They're literally just cutting that muscle and opening up that obstructive space. Nursing management. Before surgery, we want to prevent dehydration, so we want to give them as much IV fluids as we can per their weight, and we want to monitor their labs. We don't usually see a lot of laboratory changes in these kids, though. There hasn't been enough time for that to happen. Um, these kids... 
they have they really want to eat but they have a really hard time doing it so pre-operatively we don't give them anything we don't let them eat we give them as much uh, sweeties on a pacifier as we possibly can um, post-surgically this this is dependent on the physician or surgeon who is doing the procedure and or the hospital unit policies on and procedures on treating pyloric stenosis because often we just start the oral feedings as soon as they are done with the procedure in the post-op area they give them like uh an ounce of pedialyte unflavored pedialyte it's so gross but that baby is so happy about it then they bring them back to our floor and we wait an hour there's usually a little feeding chart that we use that tells us when and what we can give you wait an hour and you give another ounce of unflavored pedialyte and then the, if they haven't vomited by the next feeding then you give uh, an ounce of formula and you go from there and usually the the surgeons will say if they vomit you go back one step we don't go back to the beginning again but we go back one step so we might go from two ounces back to one and see how they do some of the education that you're going to give the parents is on preventing reflux and vomiting so we're going to do feeds that with the infant up high with the proper alignment of the neck and we want to keep them up high after eating for at least 30 minutes so that we prevent the reflux it's also good to tell parents post-operatively that they don't really have to be scared to hold their baby and burp them just be i know that they had a procedure i know that they had surgical instruments placed in their abdomen and they have a little surgical wound but but you're still able to feed them hold them diaper them they don't have to be worried about it we're going to control the pain as best we can on those infants and usually they don't have much all right so this little picture shows you a good visual of what we might see in a pyloric stenosis infant so where it says dry nappies down at the bottom nappies are usually what european people call um diapers so my husband um they show signs of dehydration they do usually have sunken fontanelles their mucosa is pretty dry and there are some irritable unhappy babies because they're not being fed um, and they're always hungry they do have um, some distension of their abdomen but sometimes you see them come in and they just look like they've never eaten anything they're so skinny and small um, you can see literally and i put a youtube video i want you guys to watch it you can see the peristalsis occur across the abdomen and it is crazy and then to the right of that is where you're going to palpate that little olive sized or marble sized um, knot we see a ton of appendicitis in kern county i am going to call out takis and hot cheetos for that you can talk to any hospitalist or pediatrician and they will usually always tell you that those types of snacks create an issue um, so appendicitis is acute inflammation of the appendix it is the most common cause of an emergent abdominal surgery being needed in a child it occurs in all age groups my husband had an appendectomy when he was a grown man which i think is very interesting um let's see so usually what causes the appendicitis is that there's poop that gets stuck in a little narrow section of the appendix and that increases some pressure edema happens and then you get bacterium and then when there's a lot of swelling and bacteria just busting out everywhere then sooner or later you get the perforation which leads to peritonitis 
we are more likely to see diffuse peritonitis in younger kids. Older kids, they can have a focal abscess, um, and it kind of is like a little sick area around the appendix, and it balls itself off. So there are lots of surgeons who now use what we call medical management of appendicitis, where they will just give um, antibiotics and then send the child home. And then they'll do a study to make sure that it has walled off and then they either don't have to do anything at all, they don't have to do any surgical procedure at all, it is walled off and it'll stay that way. Um, or it makes the removal of that appendix easier with less post-operative complications because it's walled off and you're not going to have bacteria escaping out into the perine the peritoneum. Um, so they're able to take them from being in the hospital, getting some antibiotics, go home for a week or two, they're healed up, they're feeling good, it's walled off, they come back in, they have a quick outpatient appendectomy, then they go home and they're able to be in school like usually within a day or two. Kids that have perforation, they usually come back to the unit after the surgical procedure with JP drains, uh, NG tubes, we have to put a, um, a sump, a Salem sump in them and hook them to wall suction. The, the perforated kids are pretty miserable for a while. Um, signs and symptoms of appendicitis or nausea, vomiting, uh, the abdominal pain can sometimes start out really vague, but then over time it becomes focalized at McBurney's point, which is in the lower right quadrant. They do usually have fevers. Um, you can tell that a kid has perforated if they're having all of these symptoms and then all of a sudden they're just like, I feel great. <laughs> I feel good, my stomach doesn't hurt. And then it's like 30 minutes later, they're looking pretty green and their abdomen's hard and they're spiking a high fever. Um, the complications of appendicitis are peritonitis and death. Sur surgical emergency, definitely, um, because a perforation can lead to peritonitis, which can lead to death. Um, if it's a non-perforated, Appy, it's usually laparoscopic management or medical management with antibiotics. If it is perforated, they have an open surgical procedure. They, they don't do it uh, laparoscopically. The, there is some schools of thought and evidence-based practice that is showing that watching and waiting um, can be dangerous. If it's a non-ruptured, non-gangrenous appy, they don't need am antibiotics. They usually just get a pre-operative antibiotic like ANSEF and then they're done. Um, if it's non-perforated, but it is gangrenous, then they get two to three days worth of IV antibiotics. Usually Zosin is what we're giving. Um, if it is perforated, they're getting a week to two weeks of IV antibiotics, and they usually have a couple of them. So we do routine post-op care. We give them fluids. It is very important to get these kids up and out of bed as soon as possible after surgery. Don't let them whine at you. They need to get up. If you come to the hospital to lay in bed, you're coming to the hospital to die. So if you wanna go home, you get up because we don't want to develop all of the complications from just laying there like a lump. We don't want pneumonia. We don't want um, ileus. And those are really common in kids because they'll just lay there because they don't want to hurt. So manage their pain, get them up. These are some of the chronic GI disorders that you're going to see. Um, reflux, peptic ulcer disease, constipation, Oncopresis, look that up. We talked about Hirschsprung's, 
Short bowel syndrome is interesting, and I take care of these kids. Uh, often we see them having to be repeat offenders coming back to the hospital throughout their lives um, because they have just a constellation of, of different issues because of the short gut syndrome. Um, these kids are usually in the NICU for a large portion of time. Um, inflammatory bowel disease is chronic. Celiac disease is chronic. Um, there are kids that have recurrent abdominal pain sometimes, and I want you to find out what an abdominal migraine is. That could be a thing too. Um, and then we see failure to thrive and chronic feeding problems. I'm giving you a beautiful x-ray picture of Hirschsprungs, which is also known as congenital megacolon. And the first time you see a kid's belly that has this, you'll see why it's called megacolon. Their abdomens are massive. So this is a disease that is due to aganglionic areas within the colon, which means there is no innervation. If there are no ganglia, there is no nerve signals being sent. So peristalsis, motility, all of those things that we need your colon to be able to do is not happening. So it, you get severe blockages. Um, this occurs in one in 5,000 kids and again, most often males. Um, it requires surgical treatment. It is fatal if it's not surgically treated. You will often see dark, tarry, grody stools that look similar to meconium and might technically be meconium if they have stool at all, because um, they're pretty backed up. They do vomit bile and they have a markedly swollen abdomen.